While this most definitely was my most disappointing experience in a long time, if I seem down doing this video, it's got nothing to do with that. Hey, I'm Alex Radical from Board Game Co. And this is... This is my most disappointing experience of 2022, or of 2021 too, probably. Probably both years. I'd have to think through what the most disappointing experience was. And in regards to my thing about feeling down or looking down or whatever, I'm running on too little sleep. I'm heading back to Origins tomorrow. I basically was at Origins, at Orange Game, Origins Game Fair uh, 2022. I was there for the first few days, came back home for the weekend, spent time with my family, and bringing the kids back tomorrow. It does mean that I'm running on too little sleep, trying to get too much done, and my headspace is all in the wrong places, so, so this has nothing to do with the actual disappointing experience. This is way too long of a tangent, but it is what it is. This is about Blood on the Clock Tower, and I will give you like 14 disclaimers as far as... 14 disclaimers as far as what did and didn't add or contribute to this being the most disappointing experience for me. This is my first time playing Blood on the Clock Tower. This will be my last time playing Blood on the Clock Tower. It was at Origins. It has very little or nothing to do with the, the, the person running the game. She was fantastic. It has nothing to do with the people managing the event. They were great. It has to do with a whole lot of other things that made Blood on the Clock Tower, to me, one of the worst games I have ever played. And it might be relevant to you, which is why I'm doing this video. It's not an attack on Blood on the Clock Tower. There's maybe one thing that is a specific, like, straight-up critique on I don't understand how this lends itself to a decent experience that people seem to enjoy. The rest of the things are kind of peripheral. They kind of relate to me and how I enjoy and anticipate and, and get something out of social deduction games. The ones that I like, Resistance, Quest, One Night Ultimate Werewolf, and the ones that I don't like, well, Blood on the Clock Tower for one, Mafia for another... I'd have to think through others that I've played over the years and which ones have worked for me, which ones have stood out, which ones have have been for me. But I guess the short takeaway, in case you want to skip the rest of this video, I mean, if you made it this far, I guess you're watching the rest. Maybe. I don't know. But the short takeaway is Blood on the Clock Tower is a game I will simply never play again. I would have to, in some way, have a huge incentive to do so. Either, like, completely playing it with my friends under perfect circumstances, either literally having someone pay me, I... I don't know what it takes to get me sitting down playing Blood on the Clock Tower again, but I'd have to check off a whole lot of boxes that weren't here the first time, and even then, I would expect that I would I would expect it to disappoint me, because there are many many reasons the game not not work for me, and I want to start with the peripherals. I want to start with the things that lent itself to being a bad experience before I even started with the game, because those certainly biased me against the game. Although I do not think it would have worked for me either way, as a starting baseline. And again, this is no, nothing I say is with any, any complaints about the people running the event or the person running the game. None of it. If anything, by the way, we'll get to, we'll get to some of the amazing parts of the person running the game because they were able to thrive in an atmosphere that I would have been destroyed in. This has to do with my biases, my preferences, all of that. So, starting off the bat, Blood on the Clock Tower is a game that took about 45 minutes from when we arrived till when we get started, and it's a game with no real setup or at least minimal setup, but it took around 45 minutes till we got even settled and started, and that is never something that starts me off on a good foot towards something. Feeling like my time has already been just committed to just waiting, to sitting there, to doing nothing, tends to already have me against the game. It's not, it's no different than being, than sitting down at a table to play a board game with somebody and having them pull up the manual and start reading it. It's like, oh my dear lord, I did not realize what I signed up for here. I thought I came here to play games. Now, it's not the end of the world, I, I had friends around me, I talked, we had fun, all those things, but it certainly started me off on a bad foot. The second thing that definitely did not lend itself to a positive experience is the fact that this game was taking place in a room with a whole bunch of other games. The game was taking place in a room with, I don't know, seven, eight, nine other games, a loud, echoey room in which every single group's noises and interactions could be heard and, and carried over to the next group. The cheers, the highs, the points, the accusations, different games taking place, not just Blood on the Clock Tower, but all of them lent themselves to people having experiences that overstepped their bounds onto other experiences. This is the part, by the way, where I have nothing but respect for the person running the game, because I would have, I would have let it get to me. There are different things that get to me in life. Many of them you don't know about. I, I, I try to power through things as efficiently as possible. I'm always trying to make videos, to play games, to do all this stuff, and trying to make it all work. And I love doing so. 
But there are things that absolutely get me down. There are things that those who are close to me know that these are the things that will push my buttons. And I need to work on that, to be very clear. Anytime you in life have things that push your buttons, that's not an excuse to act that way. It's a reminder that you have to fix those buttons. But I haven't yet gotten there. I know it's a problem. I know it's a me thing. But one example of something that's a me thing is if I'm trying to teach a game and multiple other sources of noises keep interrupting that experience, it slowly starts to wear on me. It slowly starts to push those buttons, those buttons that I need to fix, and I slowly get more and more frustrated. And those who know me well will see me getting visibly, visibly antsy at the fact that I'm trying to teach something and I have too many things in the way stopping me from teaching. This is where I have, again, utmost respect to the person running the game, because she was minimally flustered, if at all. Kudos to her. I think I would have been having a meltdown if I, was, I, I tried to teach a bunch of new people a new game, if every few minutes there was a, a loud cheer next to us, a, a rousing accusation, something happening, and little pauses as she looks over, smiles, like, yeah, one second, and then goes back to teaching the game, almost as if nothing happened at all. She did great. Me, not so much. To me, I don't... I've never liked board game cafes, to give you an example here. I've always never understood the appeal. Why would I ever sit down in a public, loud, noisy place when I can play a board game at home? Why would I ever sign up for that? To try a new game, I'll buy the new game. I don't like the concept of sitting in a crowded space playing a board game. Even conventions, they're, they're a little bit better, but if conventions are table to table, I still don't like that either. I like to have a little space around me, a little bit of a breathing room so I can have a conversation so that I don't have to shout to be heard so that I can enjoy this quality of time with you, with my friends, with people, without feeling like I'm being compressed on all sides. At the end of the day, I'm an introvert. It's not something I talk about a lot, but I'm definitely an introvert. I, I act extroverted. I can sit down and, and hang out and have the best time with people, but the difference between an introvert and an extrovert, extrovert, which is a longer conversation, is ultimately an extrovert has their batteries recharged by being around others, and an introvert has their batteries drained. I have my batteries drained when I'm around other people, unless you are my closest of friends, and even then, it, it depends on the quantity. Three of my closest friends, that's a great time. My batteries are being recharged all day. Seven of my closest friends, and I'm already starting to feel the drain, feeling the burn. I, I do... I love being around the people that I like, but it certainly drains my batteries, and it needs to be recharged. Put me in a room with a whole bunch of people I don't particularly, not even, not even dislike, just people that I don't know, that I don't have a close personal relationship with, and I need to keep myself powered up. I need to keep myself, I need to give myself moments. If you ever see me at a convention, you will see me alternating between being inside, trying to be as friendly and interactive with as many people as possible, and then taking a moment to step outside so I can be myself. So I can sit down, look into the sky for a few minutes, and just be alone to recharge those batteries so I can walk back in with a smile on my face because I think it's important to have a smile on your face. Well, not all the time, but generally. So, a large room with 14 games going on with loud noises coming from all sides, combined with a 45 minute delay, lent itself to blend the clock tower starting off on a bad foot. And this is where things got worse and arguably it's my fault. My fault might be a bit extreme, but you'll see what I mean in a second. This was a content creator blood on the clock tower, which means there was a bunch of content creators and a bunch of people who bought tickets kind of mingling together. And when invited, I was told, hey, you know, if you have any friends who want to join, let us know. And I didn't think to ask what the ideal number was. I just said, hey, I have a whole bunch of people who are interested in joining, but only if it works for you. Here's like eight names of people who are interested in joining. And I think the hosts of the game were trying to be accommodating when perhaps they shouldn't have accommodated me. I, I just assumed or hoped that they would just say, yeah, no, this is the ideal number, and this is the number of people we wanted you to invite. We thought, like, one or two friends, not, like, seven friends. And so, I believe, and this is conjecture on my part, I believe, based on the events that night, that there's a certain target number in which Blood on the Clock Tower is probably better to be played. Able to be played at a variety of play counts, sure, but better to be played at certain play counts, especially if you're playing with new people for the first time, especially if you're playing in a crowded room, especially if all these other facts line up. And I think that I, not with any degree of planning, but I think I unwittingly added too many players to the game and made it so that what might have been ideally a 12, 13, 14 person game of Blood on the Clock Tower turned into like a 19, 20 player game of Blood on the Clock Tower. And I think that was too much for our first game. I think I may have 
arguably made the experience worse, worse for myself and for others. Although it is worth noting, by the way, it is worth noting that many people playing the game seem to have an excellent time. That's just from the people who seem to have. And I also know from people who play the game who I've talked to, I know many of my friends who had a great time. So all these factors contributed to my experience, not necessarily their experience. So factor that in as well. Because, I mean, this is ultimately my worst experience of the past year of 2022, whatever I call this video. But having too many players meant a few things happened. It meant it contributed to the longer delay, the longer setup, the longer getting the game running. It meant that there were more roles to remember, more travelers. Travelers are these extra players that can come in out of the game in addition to the standard game you have, rules you have going. And so you have this whole sheet of rules, your roles you're already trying to memorize, as well as a bunch of travelers who are kind of in and out of the game. And you're trying to balance the number of good players, the number of bad players, the number of townsfolks, the number of villagers or, or, or outsiders, or all these different facets you're going. But on the clock tower, I probably should have said at the beginning, is a social deduction game. There's going to be good players, there's going to be bad players, there's going to be players who are trying to figure out what's going on. Bad knows a little bit more about what's going on, good knows a little bit less, but throughout the course of the game as you exchange notes about the roles the players have, you can start to figure out a little bit more. You start the game off by talking to one another, by just having a conversation. Are you good? Great. I'm, I'm glad you're good. What's your role? Who are you? Why are you not willing to answer that? Because I don't trust you. Of course I don't trust you. I don't know what you are. But maybe I can drop this information. I'm one of these four roles. That might be useful enough. Oh, well, I know this and I know that. And if you do this, I'll do that. And you start slowly drip feeding information to one another until eventually you have the, uh, the, the option, the possibility of, of casting a vote of targeting a player saying, I think they are bad, I think they are the demon, the one who needs to be killed, and hopefully you kill them, if they're the demon, but you don't really have that much information, and so the game starts off with slow rounds of information gathering, with things being unlocked, and then eventually the first day ends and the demon has a chance to target and kill someone. No vote, just someone's dead. That player is now a ghost. They have one singular vote left to use the entire game, and that singular vote will be important. It will be essential to sway the tides of, of the game when you have too many good players who have been murdered across the course of the game and too many bad players who know exactly what's going on and can now control the game themselves. And so you need to hold on to that vote as you slowly continue to figure things out. The, the minions, the imp, they need to, the demon, they need to all be on their guard the entire time. Because too many dead townsfolk still have enough power, enough sway over how things play out in the game. And that would be great if I had any idea what was going on. You throw me in a room, and this is a me problem, you throw me in a room with 20 people, 13, 14 of them who I never met before, and I'm supposed to get up and have a conversation with them about what role they are, what piece of information I remember about them. And to me, this doesn't feel like a social deduction game based around facts and logic and reasoning. It feels like a game of talking to others and hoping I can retain enough information to possibly be of value to my team. Which might be great. This is a good time to mention that I've never really liked Mafia. Or Werewolf. Any of those versions of that game. I've never loved that open sense of information. I like, I like having a degree of construct around my social deduction games. Give me a set of rules. Give me a finite scenario. Give me an exact thing that is happening right now. In Resistance, you are going on specific missions, and as things happen, you start being fed information, pieces of facts you can start using. This makes no sense if you're that. That makes no sense if you're this. And ideally, ideally you're playing with five to ten players with a limited number of roles. One I Ultimate World thrives at three to, a little more than three, five to seven players is where I find it works well, with a handful of roles and with specific things that happen during the night, and a sequence of events. And I find that these games, they work for me because they turn things into a logic puzzle. Something I can puzzle my way through and get to the end of it. And Blood on the Clock Tower isn't that for me. Which, for the record, just means it's a game that might not be for me to begin with. It doesn't make it a bad game, although I do have complaints about the game that are... We'll get to it. Too much information, too many new people, and a game that started way too late in a room that's way too crowded, and I was not having a good time at all, in the slightest. And again, people who know me will know this. People who know me will look at me across the room and understand that Alex has gone into a sheltered shutdown mode where I'm just hoping the evening will end. This is, again, no offense to any of the players. It is no offense to the people running the game. It is no offense to the, the, the moderator running the game, the game itself or the event or any of those things. It is not. It is a bunch of things that work together to make me not a fan of the experience I'm having. And here's where we get to a complaint about the game, which to me is a complaint about the game. Something that I just don't understand how this isn't a bigger problem for other people. Everything else to me is a combination of situational and game preference types or styles, whatever you have, whatever you, whatever, what have you. That's what I'm looking for, what have you. The thing for me that baffles me 
And I say this genuinely believing that I'm not exaggerating. I could be wrong. Maybe I am exaggerating because it certainly sticks with me for longer. But I, I believe that my game time was 50% with my eyes closed. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was less. Maybe it's 30%. Maybe it's 40%. Maybe it just felt like longer because I'm sitting there holding something up to my face, holding a sheet of paper up to my face as I just sit there and look downwards, hoping to just whatever's happening, just end it so we can go back to the part where I'm actually at least playing, even if I'm not enjoying myself. So much of the game was eyes closed, something from my face, waiting for the next step to happen, and it felt like 50%. It might be an exaggeration, but it felt like 50% of my game time was me not being there. Me having my eyes closed and just waiting for someone to tap me so we can all wake up and do our thing. And this will vary based on the role you have. Whether you're the demon killing people every single night, whether you have a townsfolk role that involves you doing things, there will absolutely be reasons why you are more involved in the game. But even then, I don't know what the ratio is, it just didn't feel good. When I play One Eye Ultimate Werewolf, we spend a minute with our eyes closed and then proceed to jump into an eight minute game. When I play One Eye, when I play Resistance Avalon, we spend 20 seconds with our eyes closed as I go through the sequence. Everyone, close your eyes, open your eyes, look at each other. There's a sequence to go through. This is a cost you pay to play this type of game, and I get that. But 50% felt horrendous. It felt absolutely horrendous. Like, I didn't feel like I was playing a game. I felt like I was in timeout. I don't understand how that isn't a bigger problem for others, although again, I know people who sign up for this game left, right, and center, I know people who love this game and love this experience, but that doesn't mean it was an experience for me. I don't have much else to add. I think I hit most of the key notes as far as Blood on the Clock Tower and why it was one of the worst experiences I've had in a very long time. Although I guess I will add that the last facet is, unlike a game with my friends, when there's three of us around the table and we're clearly not enjoying ourselves and we all know each other and we sense the vibe and halfway into the game someone says and says, we're not having a good time, are we? And everyone else says, we're really not. And I'm glad you finally said something. That's a lot harder to do in a room full of 20 people and you don't know half of them and you don't know their tells and you certainly don't want to ruin their time for them. And that's great, but it does mean that I felt more trapped. That I felt ultimately that I signed up for a two and a half hour long experience in which the best part of it was the 45 minutes before we started while I was still able to talk to and interact with my friends. Quacklope has a, a separate vlog on this, by the way. You can check out his kind of run back of the game and you'll get other people's opinions too. This video, the reason I chose to do it is twofold. One is because this was the worst gaming experience I've had in a long time and I cannot remember, I cannot remember what rivals this as far as the most negative memory I've had around a game in a very long time. And the second is because I think it's worth knowing. If the things that bothered me are things that might bother you, walk into that understanding. If you are interested in Blood on the Clock Tower, maybe there's a certain way that it will be the best way and opportunity for you to enjoy it. It's a game that many people have been excited about and many people have been enjoying in different ways and may well be a game that's right for you. Pick apart the areas that I talked about that will or won't bother you and try to have an optimal first experience because on my end, I don't see a way that I ever play Blood on the Clock Tower again. With that, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, have a good one.